Well, good morning, everyone. I appreciate uh, all the effort that's taken you to be here and all the effort that's taken to put together the forum. So I'd like to reward all that effort with a quality presentation as best I can. I do promise that it will be a high-level overview. It will be fast-paced, and I would be more than pleased to address questions um, as they arise afterwards and to follow up with you on, on various details. So I'm here to represent six universities and the USDA and to summarize our effort to enhance the utility of grafting in U.S. vegetable industries, including organic. As an SCRI, USDA SCRI supported team, we are actually a subset of the larger community nationally that is doing the same, that is essentially doing their best to enhance the utility of grafting in, in, in the vegetable industries, including organic. And as you might guess, doing so takes a very wide range of talents, very wide range of expertise, and a commitment to the entire spectrum of research to extension, education, and <coughs> in a, in a very integrated and stakeholder focused approach, which is what we are following. We, are organ we have organized our activities around three major topics. The first is grafting methodology. Grafting, as you might know, interrupts the normal production of standard ceilings for use in field and other uh, situations with a potentially mortal wounds of uh, grafted of uh, rootstock and scion seedlings and then the requirement for healing them to produce what is uh, expected to be a superior plant. It also requires twice the number of seedlings as would be uh, as is required in an ungrafted situation. So many questions, many opportunities within the grafting process. Likewise, our second area of focus is on optimizing the utility of those grafted plants in a variety of settings and systems, uh, both semi-protected and outdoor field and uh, for the most part, and optimizing the performance of those same grafted plants in, in those various situations. Our third, merit, third major area of focus is in grafting economics. What is the return on investment to not only those who produce grafted plants for a living, but also those who would use them in some way um, in, on their, in their farm practice. Is the return in the black or is it in the red, so to speak? So as far as getting the word out um, and uh, essentially offering the, res offering the resources that uh, we produce, we take a very wide range uh, of approaches, which I'm going to go through here very, very quickly. One is the vegetablegrafting.org website, which has, among many other resources, a database of referee journal articles and similar technical reports related to the making and using and evaluating of grafted vegetable plants, particularly within farming uh, contexts. We also offer symposia. Have we, have off we will be offering our fifth this coming July. Um, abstracts are still being accepted for the second international grafting symposium, vegetable grafting symposium, which will be held in July in, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, but we have held four previous symposia as well. Of course, as you might expect, we are active in our respective um, professional societies, American Society for Horticultural Science, American Phytopathological Society, and others, where we host workshops and colloquia and get, deliver presentations. We're also very, very active within the extension uh, circuit, if you will, and at programs much like Organicology, much like this research forum, and many other grower conferences and uh, conventions where growers meet in large numbers, particularly organic growers. <coughs> of course, we author um, newsletter articles as well with a local regional reach. We are offering webinars. Uh, the next one uh, is scheduled for February 21st. These are free online webinars, and you are very welcome to, to uh, register and uh, participate in one, and they are recorded, so you can also go back um, to look at uh, and view the previous versions. We have our own, of course, pro programmatic web pages, as you might, might guess. Um, we author articles that are printed in um, uh, publications read by a very large number of growers throughout the country, including organic growers. Here, the Moses Organic Broadcaster is just one example. Um, Vegetable Growers News is, is a second example, where we're trying to reach as many people uh, with uh, the results of our work and interest in our work as, as possible. Of course, we're offering narrated videos as well and making good use of social media along the way. There are other events offered as well. We have an event map, so we try to catalog what is happening, what has happened, and what will happen. So 
Again, you can go to vegetablegrafting.org, click on the events map, and find out where a vegetable grafting related event is, is going to be uh, occurring or has occurred. These include field days and demonstrations, including to master gardeners and others uh, very much interested in uh, sustainable uh, production. Um, train to train approaches, if you will, engaging other folks who are in, uh, advising growers or uh, folks to whom growers go for advice or input. So wanting to keep them uh, aware as, of what we are doing and, and finding. Offering grafting clinics have very large programs, much like the Great Lakes Expo, where people can drop by and just talk vegetable grafting and learn the process, for example. Um, invited exhibits and learning tables, at industry led meetings and trade shows very uh, widespread use of face-to-face -face classroom and hands-on in instruction types of uh, learning for, for growers and being very active within the two and four-year educational uh, undergraduate graduate arena as well and as I mentioned to many growers often don't be surprised if somebody that you know comes home from school and says hey we got to try grafted plants and, and they were introduced to it there first um, because there's quite a bit of activity within the, within the educational realm. We manage a listserv, which can consistently attracts new, new subscribers. And just in case you are uh, unfamiliar with grafting, currently tomato and watermelon are the two most often grafted plants, uh, crops in the, in the U.S., but interest in, in eggplant and pepper and cucumber and melon uh, is definitely increasing. In the big picture, grafting is a production tool and a source of income. It is both. It speeds the delivery of traits to farms. Otherwise, we would need to have the status quo, which is the development of improved varieties, which takes time, money, and a lot of effort, and it always requires compromise. Using grafted plants, growers can make faster and more effective use of genetics on the farm because we can separate root-based traits from scion-based traits and combine, combine those tools of production tool. Now, as a source of income, in as much as there is demand for grafted plants, there will need to be a supply. And so there is the making and selling of grafted plants to consider as a source of income. And it is a business opportunity for many in the, the, because the demand seems to be strong and increasing among growers and gardeners. Uh, this is a, an under, this was true, of, these numbers were true as, as of 2015, but they are out of touch with uh, today's numbers, which are much, much larger. Millions of grafted plants being produced and used in the U.S. Uh, each year, and so this does represent a business opportunity for propagators of one sort or another, particularly those who are able to work with and willing to work with organic growers and need a product that would be certified, of, co of course. So this interest goes uh, way back. Um, it certainly did not begin with this particular project, but um, you know, one of the first questions that arises is, well, what rootstock variety and what scion variety should I pair? Well. Uh, some years ago, colleagues of, uh, of mine at, at the universities that are shown here attempted to address some of those questions and the performance questions as well within organic systems over a three-year time period uh, sponsored by IOP, USDA IOP, and, and uh, local sponsors and followed up by a project that I coordinated, funded in part by Sears Trust, where we sent grafted plants to 31 growers in 13 states after an exhaustive level of communication with them about their interests and their needs. We sent them, we produced the plants at Ohio State, we sent them out to, to uh, growers in those 13 states and very much were uh, uh, welcome to receive their feedback and input. We've tested the grafted plants under organic high tunnel conditions, uh, assessing the fruit yield and quality of course. And I'm going here through quickly through just examples of the types of work that are, that are being done. We've asked can grafted plants you perform at a high level using less water? The broad answer is yes. David Suchoff and Chris Gunter's work um, at North Carolina State University the, only brings this into greater focus and greater potential because of his, David's, and, and Chris's assessment of roots, root system architecture and its influence on nutrient acquisition and water acquisition, for example. So the study that I'm showing here is just a bit of a precursor uh, to that. Um, we're also exploring the potential additive effects that grafting may have within production systems, specifically organic. What, what value might, it, might grafted plants bring to other production tools and tactics? For example, strip tillage. The wrap against strip tillage is often that it is less, those systems are often less productive than 
bed shaped beds with plastic uh, coverings. If we can enhance the productivity of strip tilled systems, perhaps they would become more in, um, more appealing to growers. Will grafted plants assist in that? The quick answer seems to be possibly. Very the strong evidence uh, based in Worcester anyway is that uh, that that very well may be the case. We're also asking: Do do grafted plants and microbial based inoculants? But certainly, microbial based inoculants um, are very common within organic production. Do they make a good pair? The data appear to suggest yes, they very well may. So, looking at additive effects. Brian Ward and his co-workers at Clemson University have asked question, important questions about grafted watermelon, comparing based in part based on based in part on the expected price um, received for conventional versus uh, versus uh, organic watermelon, and found that within their production system, again I'm broad brushing this, a three-year study compressed to an about 30-second summary, um, they did find that the use of grafted plants did increase the yield of organically grown watermelon. A very, very important takeaway message there. In fact, that's not too terribly surprising to us because we do see that small to medium scale organic growers in many areas were among the first to adopt grafted plants and are continue to adopt them at a high rate, particularly those that use them in high tunnels. But grafting economics, again, that third area of focus for, for this team that I mentioned up front, grafting e economics are largely unsettled. They're a bit complicated to evaluate and it's essential to take all the debits and credits into account. They're also personal because they hinge on how various aspects of an operation are valued. You know, how does one assess positive and negative impacts and what dollar value does one assign to them? Dr. Shin Sao and her coworkers at University of Florida have taken a, a, a highly structured look at this, comparing uh, conventional and organic uh, e grafting economics. And one of their take home messages um, here is that grafted tomato production may be more profitable on high tunnel systems under organic production, that it's important to use grafted plants when selecting rootstocks uh, to facilitate early planting and so forth. And so the economic feasibility of grafted production is, depends on the rootstock sign combination and of course the market price. But again, the take home message here is that the, the economics are being examined uh, very, very carefully. Carol Miles and her team at Washington State University uh, is attempting to address the question very well, is grafting for you in a grower context? and have uh, authored an excellent publication shown down the cover page shown uh, down in the lower right there that somebody can use to go through step by step and, and, and get a better assessment on whether or not grafting is, is appropriate for them. There's no doubt, even though the grafting economics are unsettled, there is no doubt that grafted plants cost more than ungrafted ones, okay? However, grafted plants can yield ungrafted ones 10 to 50 percent, sometimes more. And in some cases, grafted plants allow harvests to occur when they otherwise would not have, if only because of the roots, uh, roots, uh, root-based, uh, soil-based disease issues. Okay, so how does one put a price tag on being able to offer a product when, uh, when they otherwise would not be able to? And as far as the cost of grafted plants is concerned, one area of particular interest to us is: can we reduce the number of grafted plants in certain situations to offset their cost? And the, and the quick answer is quite possibly, okay? So does it pay? My personal assessment over roughly 12 to 13 years now talking with many growers is that for every four, two are positive, one is negative, and one is on the fence, still undecided. So that's the breakdown that, that uh, seems to still hold. Um, I, I, I'm listening carefully, but that's the breakdown that seems to still hold. Lots of enthusiasm, some saying, yeah, I tried that, didn't really work out for me. Some saying, well, I'm going along slowly, I'm not quite committed fully. So in summary, I think as a production tool and a source of income, the potential is as high and it's untapped. We do see steadily increasing use and value of, uh, of grafted plants as tools and sources of income. On the negative, there are issues, there are some risks. Grafting is an excellent way of spreading disease in the seedling nursery. It's a fantastically efficient way of spreading disease. And there are unanswered questions, uh, some of which may have been uh, alluded to here in this brief overview. So as I speak with growers and I speak with others in, uh, who advise them, for example, I encourage them to continue to evaluate grafted plants in some way in their farm or in their operation. And I also remind them that help for that is available. If they are unfamiliar with grafting, gra the making or using or evaluating of grafted plants, 
they, they help is nearby, so all they need to do is look, uh, reach out. I do think it's a technology worthy of careful attention and careful and uh, continued testing. And with that, I hope to have at least whetted your appetite to learn more about this. I realized that it was a very fast, very high level flyby overview of vegetable grafting and organic systems. Um, but I will be happy to address your questions here or, or, or afterwards. So. Sure. Five minutes for questions. Sure. So, yeah. Um, you know, how many the people using drafting now are they more are they are there more non-organic people doing it? Are they tend to be larger commercial operations doing it? Um, or so, it has it been kind of across the board in terms of the scale of use? Paraphrasing, the question is uh, what type of grower or farm operation are using grafted plants most consistently, perhaps in greatest number? My answer is every type of operation, but there are five characteristics that tend to uh, create the highest likelihood that grafting will have a positive return on investment. One, they have a soil-borne disease issue that they are unable to control in some other way or manage in some other way. Second, their preferred variety that they take to market is susceptible to that disease. Third, not growing that variety or just taking themselves out of the market is truly not an option. Fourth, they cannot rotate away from their problems. And fifth, there is at least one rootstock that can address that soilborne disease issue. Now, you put that all together, and what you find is that conventional and organic growers alike are interested in them. It's just that the economies of scale being what they are and the prices and so on being what they are, it seems to have been so far that uh, mid-scale growers who harvest many times, and I'm speaking especially of tomato, who harvest many times, um, who have a decent price for their product, are the most likely to adopt grafted plants first. So I hope that addresses it. Yes? Oh, and can we use the microphone? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, some violins are particularly difficult for a lot of, for some organic growers. Is there, are there research results on grafting that has been suggested as a potential partial solution at least for I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first couple of words. What's, what's difficult for organic growers? Symphilins. Symphilins. Um, I do not recall that coming up in any grafting conversations, but we should, we should talk after that. I, I think uh, symphilins are a Western problem mostly. Yeah. But yeah, that that's that would be a big interest in the West uh, to have restock. And I've seen things like Tetzakoda mm -hmm. uh, squash being um, uh, showing some symphilum tolerance, maybe. Um, yeah. Um, now I'm, I'm sorry. I was I was equating it with something else. I apologize. So I do agree with you. Anywhere where there's a potential genetic solution, which grafting is essentially a genetic solution to production issues. My question. I'm, Upon reader, so I've been interested in the genetics of root stocks, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I see very little written on it. It's mostly private industry that's working on them. Um, you know, tomatoes in particular, you grow the root stocks, some look like um, wild tomato species and things like that. But is there any source you can go to to find out more about that? I would encourage you to contact, uh, just as one person, uh, David Francis, my colleague at OSU, is a tomato breeder geneticist. Uh, very active in this area, and there, of course, there are a number of other breeder geneticists in this project as well. But you're absolutely correct that the majority of the rootstocks, if not all of the rootstocks that, I, that come to mind right now, were developed in the private sector, and there is uh, the information available on them is only what is in the public domain, which is arguably the seed catalogs. Time yeah. for one more quick question. Have a great day. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, Matt. Sure.